Welcome to the first uh, true ESS 330 lecture, Introduction to Units and Dimensions. So why discuss units? Well, we're going to be doing quantitative analysis, but um, rarely do quantities exist without an associated unit. That is to say, you know, you could just be counting, then you know that would that would be just um, just a value, just a quantity. Um, there are some cases where technically, for instance, like ratios are unitless. But in general, if we're going to have a number, it probably is associated with one of the the fundamental units that we're interested in, whether that's length or time or mass. So we're going to talk about one of the most famous unit conversion errors of all time. We're going to talk about the, the international uh, standard system of units, how to convert units algebraically, um, fundamental, and then composite dimensions, a dimensional analysis, which will assist you in figuring out how to relate um, quantities of different uh, of, diff of things with different units, um, rules for working with dimensions, and then we'll talk about exponential population growth, an important thing in ecology, scale, um, graphing, uh, significant figures, orders of magnitude, and then problem solving. So the most sort of media worthy units error um, that that's been observed was in back in 1999 um, uh, there was a, a math error made for with uh, oh God, I hate this so if you want to see the effects of making a unit error um, this is back from 1999 and um, it was involved a, a satellite, the Mars Polar um, uh, Lander, and the specifically the sol the uh, surveyor that was supposed to work as a, a sort of a meteorology satellite to assist with uh, uh, operations on the surface. And what happened was a contractor um, developed a, a particular uh, set of calculations based on um, uh, pound seconds of force instead of the SI units of Newton seconds uh, specified in the contract. And so as a consequence, rather than going nicely into orbit, the, um, the satellite wound up entering the atmosphere and burning up. So just to show you how to do the conversion, um, so 4.45 roughly newtons is equal to one pound force. Um, uh, so 500 pound force is equivalent to how many newtons? Well, you know, it's it's nice to work these things out algebraically. So um, we have 500 pound force times 4.45 is approximately newtons per pound force. And therefore, you get uh, 2,224 newtons. So we have basic units, OK? And they're associated dimensions. So the dimensions are um, you know, specific attributes of the the universe, fundamental things like length, mass, time, uh, electrical current, temperature, uh, luminous intensity or, or brightness, um, and the amount of a substance. Okay, and for those, you can see the associated. You should you probably know this by now. You know we use meters, kilograms, seconds, amperes, kelvin, candela, and moles to um, to measure those fundamental properties of the universe. 
So a Newton is the force required to make a mass of one kilogram accelerate at a rate of one meter per second per second on the Earth's surface. Okay, so one Newton is one kilogram times meters divided by seconds squared. So that's one way, one convention you can use for denoting units. Here's another way, an equation style. Um, a scientific style, you know, essentially different just because it's easier to put in a publication, right? You don't have to, to put in the, the fancy you know, numerator and denominator, for instance. And then this is unit style. So now instead of dealing with kilograms, meters, and seconds, we're dealing with mass, length, and time. So let's look at converting units algebraically. Um, your instructor, say, ran at 10 miles an hour towards Fort Collins. What was his speed in meters per second? Well, this is really the proper way to break this out um, so that you don't make mistakes. Um, 10 miles per one hour, that's the speed. 1,609 meters per mile to make the conversion to meters. One hour over 3,600 seconds. Multiplying through, it's 4.47 meters per second. Your instructor wishes he could do that. Right. And so algebraically, you could just knock out the... Um, the uh, the units that um, that cross out algebraically. So miles, hours, and now we're left with meter and seconds. Who runs faster? Your instructor or Usain Bolt? who has the 100 meter world record of 9.58 seconds. Well, that's 10.44 meters per second. Of course, it's only for a few seconds. What was his velocity in miles per hour when he ran the 100 mile, uh, meter world record? Well, 100 meters divided by 9.58 seconds times miles per 1609 meters times 3600 seconds over hour is equal to 23.4 miles per hour. So the, the thing here to note is that it's, it's easy if you're not doing a conversion that you, that you do all the time to sort of just combine everything into a single factor and, you know, you can certainly Google many of these conversion factors between like miles per hour and meters per second. But if you're dealing with situations in which they're unfamiliar units or um, and, and wouldn't necessarily have a conversion factor available, best to work these things out algebraically. Okay, so a dimension is a property, uh, a measurement of a physical variable with, without a numerical value. So we have, again, length, time, mass, temperature, amount. Secondary or composite dimensions are derived from fundamental dimensions. So area is length times length or length squared, volume is length times length times length or length cubed. Density is um, uh, mass per length uh, uh, cubed. Units can be counted or measured, and they're a measure of that, that dimension. So centimeters, meters, foot, yard, etc. 
done. Um, a length plus a length must be a, a length. A length squared plus a length squared must be a length squared. The dimensions have to be the same to be added together. And similarly, a length cubed um, or a volume plus a length cubed is equal to a length cubed. You can't add a length, a length squared, and and get something else. It, it, it's not a, it's it's just not a correct operation. So, um, a length by length is an area. So, um, and this is a problem that in uh, remote sensing students often. Um, uh, screw up, you know, how many uh, meters squared are there? In a meter squared, how many centimeters squared are there? Well, there's 100 meter, uh, centimeters per meter, but we're talking about an area, so that we need 100 squared to get 10,000 um, centimeters squared. Uh, how many centimeters cubed in a meter cubed? Well, we know that it's that would be 100 times 100 times 100. So that is a million. Yes. Or 10 to the power of 6. So length, fundamental, area, and volume composite. It just so happens in this case that it's made up of multiple um, um, dimensions, but and all those dimensions are of the same are the same length. But it doesn't have to be true, right? You can have you can mix and match different dimensions to get new um, new units. New units? No, I'm sorry. New dimensions new composite dimensions for your calculation. So, mass, volume, density. Um, all mass is fundamental, uh, volume is composite, and then mass per volume is also composite. Temperature, right? Fundamental. Um, converting between Kelvin and uh, Celsius or centigrade just is the addition or subtraction of the constant 273.15. So, along with SI units, we have. Um, their prefaces, right? So um, nano, so a nanometer, which we use in remote sensing, that's one uh, billionth of a meter, okay? Uh, so light has a wavelength of, you know, the visible light between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, micro, uh, so that's one millionth of a unit. So micrometers, um, Thermal remote sensing uses uh, light with a uh, wavelength of approximately 12 uh, micrometers. Milli, you know, uh, that's uh, one thousandth. Centi, one hundredth. Deci, tenth. Kilo is um, uh, one thousand. Mega is a million. Giga is a billion. Um, tera is a trillion, and peta is a uh, quadrillion. And, um, you know, peta and giga are terms that come up, for instance, when we're doing global carbon. Okay, so, you know, there's approximately 750 uh, petagrams of carbon in the atmosphere. 
So rules for working with dimensions. When quantities are multiplied, the result is a product of the dimensions. Okay, so if we have velocity, which is units of, of length per time, and time, multiply it by time, then the um, time drops out of velocity and we're left with a length. When one quantity is divided by another, the result is a ratio of the dimensions and units of the two quantities. So if we have um, mass per unit time as a production divided by mass, okay, that means that you know, it's essentially uh, the same as multiplying by one over mass, right? And so mass in the first um, in production is going to um, is going to cancel out one over mass. And so that's going to give you a per time uh, value. Uh, dimensionless ratios. Uh, result whenever you divide two quantities with the same dimensions. So um, velocity times time is length divided by time. Um, times time, that's going to give you a length divided by length, that's going to give you one. Um, could be some other ratio, but it's dimensionless. Uh, exponents and logarithms have no units or dimensions. Okay. Conversion factors are dimensionless radians, ratios with different units, okay? So, um, you know, 35.274 ounces per kilogram, that's a, a mass over a mass, and therefore no, no uh, units, sorry, no dimensions. Um, addition and subtraction can only be applied to quantities with the same units so that's a big hint you know if you're if you're working on a problem and you're trying to add things with different quantities i'm sorry with different uh units then you know there's a problem and and there's an additional step that needs to be made quantities set equal to each other must have the same dimensions and so when we're going to look at um, modeling, and we're going to be updating the values of certain amounts, say the amount of biomass in a system, okay? And so when we have equations that predict uh, a value to be added to biomass, those units ought to have the same dimensions, okay? So in this case, it's... Um, uh, but newtons uh, equal to uh, newtons times or newtons per distance squared times a distance squared. That gives you if, if the right hand does not equal the left hand in terms of its dimensions, then you, you can't make that assignment. Um, dimensions are unchanged by magnitude. Um, probabilities are dimensionless ratios. Um, and pure numbers like e or pi have no dimensions. So for instance, exponential population growth. Um, on the left, we have we're going to be looking at the the number of say a particular species um, at time t is equal to the number at time zero times e to the power of rt, where rt is, t is time, and r is uh, some kind of constant. Um, so t being in years, um, r must be equal to per years, or more generally, t being the unit time, um, sorry, the dimension time, R must be in the dimensions of per time. So here's an example. If the current population of Sustania is 120 million, how long will it take for its population to double? The current annual population growth rate, R, is 0 0.012, okay? 
So, and t, number of times t is equal to number of times zero, um, times one point uh, one plus r growth rate to the power of t, which you can write and calculate more conveniently as the number of times t is equal to the number of times zero times e to the power of rt. Um, so, um, what are the knowns? Well, the knowns are the, the current population and the growth rate. And um, what we want to solve for is t. So, um, we can rearrange this. We were interested in how long it would take for the population to double. So NT is equal to 240 million. And zero is the initial population at 120 million. And the rate constant is 0 0.012. So um, what we need to do there is figure out T. So we do a little algebra um, and divide um, NT by N zero to get two which is equal to, uh, you know, the exponent of 0 0.012 um, t. Um, take the log of both sides. So log 2 um, is equal to 0 0.012 um, r. And so dividing log 2 divided by 0 0.012 is equal to t. Okay. So that gives us 58 years approximately as the solution. Okay, so units of energy, joules and watts. Uh, a joule is the energy required to exert a force of one newton for a distance of one meter. And a watt is the number of joules per second. So here we have solar radiation in uh, a couple of days in January. And this is watts per square meter. So this is the energy um, um, energy incident on the surface of the Earth um, in watts per square meter. And you can see that's sort of the average watts per square meter. Um, so, uh, uh, Kilowatt is a thousand watts or a thousand joules per second um, or a kilojoule per second. So if you have a thousand watt bulb or say 10, 100 watt bulbs burning for an hour, then you have um, uh, a kilowatt hour, um, which is equal to a kilojoule per second times 3,600 seconds. So 3,600 kilojoules. Here's an example that has uh, application to global warming. Um, so different greenhouse gases have different effects on the Earth's warming. So two key ways in which the gases differ from each other are, you know, they, their ability to absorb energy or radiative efficiency, and then how long those gases stay in the atmosphere, also known as their lifetime. Um, so global warming potential was developed to allow comparisons of the impacts of different gases relative to CO2. Specifically, it's a measure of how much energy the emissions of one unit mass of a gas will absorb over a period of time relative to the emissions one unit of the same mass of carbon dioxide um, uh, will. Um, the time period usually used for global warming potential is about 100 years. So nitrous oxide um, has a, a global warming potential about 300 times that of CO2 for a 100 time, a year time scale. Methane has a uh, global warming potential 25 times that of CO2 for a uh, 100 year time scale. So in this case, um, um, that becomes a, a new unit, which is the CO2 equivalent. So if you have an industrial site emitting 150 tons of CO2, nine tons of nitrous oxide, 27 tons of methane in one day, what's the 100-year time horizon global warming of these emissions? 
in CO2 equivalents. Oh. 150 um, plus uh, 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 tons of CO2 plus nine tons of uh, nitrous oxide times 298 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of nitrous oxide plus 27 tons of methane times 25 tons of CO2 equivalent per tons of methane. And that gives you a total of 300 and um, I'm sorry, 3,507 tons of CO2 equivalent. And if we want to convert that from um, the, the tons of CO2 to the tons of, tons of carbon, okay, so, um, CO2, the molecular weight is 44. Um, C, molecular weight is just 12. So you multiply it by 12 over 44 to get 956 tons of CO2 as uh, carbon. And that's a really important distinction to look for in the literature because sometimes people will talk in terms of CO2. Sometimes people will talk in ton tons of carbon. So dimensional or dimension analysis. So we're going to an analyze the relationships between different physical quantities by identifying their fundamental dimensions, length, mass, time, and temperature, and their units of measurement. So miles and kilometers, pounds and kilograms or grams, Fahrenheit versus Celsius. So attention to how these dimensions and units combined are required to understand the problem and to understand the meaning of physical processes as well as to make correct calculations. So dimensional homogeneity, all value equations we've already said must be dimensionally homogeneous. All additive terms and equalities must have the same dimensions or there's an error. You need to find out what went wrong. So in this uh, uh, equation, X is distance, V is velocity, T is time, and A is acceleration. Okay, so we're saying what is the distance given the distance at time zero plus the velocity times time plus the acceleration times time square, in this case over two. Um, we're dealing with um, dimensions, so it doesn't matter. Um, the divide over two doesn't doesn't change dimensions, so we can ignore that. So what we've got here is length equals length plus velocity times time plus acceleration times time squared, or length equals a length plus a length per time times time. So the per time and time cancel out, give you a length, and then a length per time squared times time squared. So again, the time square and the time per, uh, I'm sorry, per um, square cancel out to give you a length. So this equation is dimensionally homogeneous. So 40 meters plus 11 centimeters. Um, well, yeah. Either A or B is correct. So 1.5 meters times three kilograms. Um, which one of these is correct? Um, again, A or B um, would be val valid although B would be very strange. Um, so 1.5 meters minus three kilograms per meter times meters per second, that's impossible to evaluate, right? There's, there's just no way um, without knowing a heck of a lot more about this particular problem um, that one could 
um, convert to a homogeneous set of units or dimensions. So here's another problem. If X is the dimensions of, dis of distance and U and V have dimensions of velocity, M has dimensions of mass, T has dimensions of time, and G has dimensions of acceleration, units of length per time squared, is the following equation dimensionally valid? Well, let's see. So what we're saying here is that, first of all, you don't have to worry about the constants, right? So um, four over three falls out. U has a dimension of length um, times uh, per time, one over time. Um, T has dimensions of time. G has dimensions of length times um, time, you know, to the negative two um, per second per second times uh, t squared. So that's time um, squared uh, divided by x, which is distance of per length. So you work these out, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to combine them by switching the signs of the exponents on the denominator. So on the top, the first two um, elements there are for just from the top of the equation, length times per time, times time. And then instead of having length per time squared, um, what you instead have is uh, one over length times time squared, right? And then instead of having time squared, you have per time squared. And then instead of having, instead of length um, um, to the negative one, you then have length to the one or, you know, just length. We combine these together, rearrange, and what we find is what? Um, we have a length is equal to, we have the, the length um, to the negative first times length cancels out. So that gives us length. Then we look at all the times and all the times cancel out. So we are left with a length. And therefore, um, so long as yeah x has dimensions of distance, then we're fine. It's this equation dimensionally uh, valid. It is not. Um, and I will leave it for you to figure out why that isn't so. And I, I wish you would go through and do that. So, composite or derived dimensions. Um, so, area, just a, a, an L squared, a volume, L cubed, velocity. Um, length per time, respiration, okay? That's gonna be volume per time or length cubed per time. And kinetic energy is going to be in units of mass times length per time squared. So that means that um, the energy is going to be, for instance, in the, the units of um, uh, mass per area per second squared. Um, other composite derived uh, dimensions, volume, okay? So that's L cubed. Usually the units for the composite dimension are all the same. If they aren't, then they really ought to be. Um, however, acre foot is a unit of volume used in hydrology, and um, you know an acre is forty-five thousand three hundred ninety feet squared. Um, but acre foot is used to, for instance, um, allow you to easily convert between volumes and 
the amount of water that you would have over um, an acre of land. So for instance, water is bought and sold in acre feet because, um, or traditionally has been, because a farmer who has 200 acres and needs three inches of, rain, of water for that area can easily compute how many acre feet he or she needs. The equivalent would be the hectare meter. So how many cubic meters in an acre foot? Acre is 43,560 feet squared. Uh, and acre foot is 43,560 feet cubed. And so now that we're at a, 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 a length cubed, right? We can then do a direct unit conversion between 43,560 feet cubed um, times a single meter, uh, a cubic meter over the conversion factor, which is 3.281 cubed feet cubed, right? Because it's 3.281 feet per meter squared, which gives you um, 1,233 cubic meters, the equivalent of a, uh, a, a cube that has lengths of 10.72 meters on a side. And there you can see just canceling out the units. Uh, other quantities based on, on uh, composite dimensions, loss or gain rate. So N there would be number per time. Um, N uh, entities per mass number per um, uh, say mass so like the number of cells you have per gram entities per length n times uh, uh, per l animals per transect for instance then uh, that might be a count uh, density the number per area concentration the number per um, volume and then we have things like um, the flux of entities so the numbers per area per time. And so that might be the vertical flux of, um, of propagules. Um, entity movement might be the number per unit length per time. So that might be migration out of the, the line um, surrounding a reserve. Energy efficiency. So this is you know the number of individuals per a given amount of energy or um, or the number of outspring per joule of food occupancy so this is like the number um, the number time per um, area so that might be um, the ant hours per of foraging per meter squared um, then we have per quantity, uh, per capita quantities for various dimensional entities. So um, length uh, per number, like the spacing of plants, the area per number, so like an avian territory or the crown area of a tree, the volume per number, like um, for instance, the volume of water being filtered by a clam, um, the time per number, so for instance, um, the amount of time between um, um, mitosis for a, a, for a cell, um, the mass per number, so that'd be like the mass on a per cell basis or a per organism basis, um, the energy per number, so that might be for a, the caloric, caloric content of a particular uh, average organism. The interaction of entities, be modeled as um, using n to a particular power. So for instance, you have uh, a certain number of cells, the number of potential interactions uh, for those cells is going to be uh, the, the dimensions n squared, okay? Um, the diversity might be the, the number square per, um, area. The interaction frequency might be the number squared per time. 
Um, and then we have various more complex entity interactions. Here's a, a table of common units in ecosystem science. So um, if you were doing, uh, well, if you were doing wildlife biology, for instance, you might need an acceleration, areas, concentrations, obviously, um, energy, um, force, um, frequency, which we use in remote sensing, for instance. So that's actually one per second or per second is the, the value of Hertz. Um, light values, luminance, for instance. Um, photon flux uh, is often used in, um, in ecophysiological models where you want to know how many photons are coming in for a given unit time. Um, mass density, mass flow, mass flux, um, power we've talked about, uh, velocity, viscosity, volume, just various things that you see in ecosystem models. Um, let's talk a bit about scale. So um, here we have, we're back to the same equation of the, the number at time t being equal to the number of times zero times exponent or e to the power of, if you if you like, the growth constant times time. So here we have the solution for that. You know, if we, you started with 10 and you had a rate of 0.2 per year and 100 years, so exponential growth. Um, very often we will put this on a logarithmic y-axis. Um, because um, a number of reasons. First of all, um, you can actually read the slope. Um, the, the slope is actually the uh, equal to the R constant. Um, so that makes it easier. Um, it also allows you to look at variability during that time if you had some sort of random um, factor that was also, you know, if you had like a random mortality factor, um, that was changing um, by a, a small amount the uh, the n for a particular year, then um, you might not see that if you use the linear scale on the left. Um, so you'd use a logarithmic so you could see those details in, in the context of the overall um, logarithmic growth. So scale is a, a rule or a formula used to measure the magnitude of a dimension. So most scales are linear. So the magnitude different between, difference between integers on the scale is the same. So the difference between one meter and two meters is the same as between seven meters and eight meters. Some scales can be nonlinear or logarithmic. So the Richter scale is one common one. pH is another one. If you have a uh, um, uh, difference between a magnitude one and magnitude two earthquake, right, is not anything like the difference between the magnitude eight and a magnitude nine. In this case, the ratios are equal, right? Magnitude two is twice as powerful as magnitude one, and magnitude nine is ten times. Uh, I'm sorry, the magnitude two is ten times a magnitude one. A magnitude nine is ten times a magnitude eight, um, but the magnitude eight is ten to the ten million times as strong as a magnitude one. And so um, we sometimes use logarithmic scale to. Um, um, fit observations into a um, particular, uh, uh, into a, an individual graph. Now, in this case, on the x-axis, it's, um, it's the number of stems in a forest plot. And on the y-axis, it's their average mass. Um, and so, Number of stems, you know, forests can go from, you know, millions of seedlings to just a few very large trees. So that's a, a big difference. You might have uh, 
you know, hundreds of, um, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of times difference between the number of individuals in a forest plot, individual trees, that is. And their mass can very much change. When you have just a few, you know, when you have many, many seedlings, you have very little um, biomass. When you have just a few large ones, then you uh, you have, can have a large large mass. And so this kind of plot was was is um, used to look at the change in the the average mass of an individual as the number of individuals in a forest plot decreases as you go from right to left. So there you go, stem density, average biomass of plants. So there we see their units, numbers per, per meters squared, kilograms per N per individual. And one thing you might notice here is that N is on both scales, okay? This is from a famous paper, Weller 87, because um, this is was a very common diagram, plant self-thinning diagram, um, again, showing how the size of the average uh, plant increased as the number of stems decreased. But Weller points out, well, you've got N on both scales, and that's not really that's not really right because what's what's going to happen is it's going to decrease the apparent variability of the the dots in that graph and you've already decreased it um, um, by um, using a logarithmic scale the apparent variability seems less So before I go on to significant figures, I don't want to have to record that last slide because it took a while. The point is that by thinking about what those units are, he realized that in fact, um, that diagram um, was um, leading people to believe that there was less variability in that relationship than there actually was. Um, and so, that wound up being a, a very important paper in the history of forestry and forest ecology. So now I'm gonna go on to significant figures. Um, I just wanted to add that in because, boy, I didn't wanna to have to record that slide twice. So significant figures or significant digits are the number of digits that carry meaning that contribute to the precision of that value. So, um, this may require, uh, this is, you know, affected by rounding. Um, so, for instance, um, if you're measuring fish body lengths, um, you know, particularly if you measure a whole bunch of them, right, and then you take an average, well, you, you'll wind up with, um, you know, a very long number. Um, but, in fact, you know, these, these this is in units of centimeters is it likely that you were actually able to measure to better than one millimeter, uh, that is a tenth of a centimeter, um, during your measurements? Well, no. So probably um, that uh, one significant digit beyond the uh, decimal point is appropriate. So you round that off. Um, using more significant figures that implied by the data provides a false sense of accuracy. So we, we don't want to do that. So the number of decimal places you see is not the same as significant figures. Again, it's easy to see because you can, you know, um, average a large number of variables and get a figure, uh, a number with a lot of decimal places, but you really haven't changed your significant figures. Um, in this case, um, we are showing you a number correctly that has two significant figures, right? But four decimal places. And that's just a, that's just a function of the, the units we're using to show you. Those significant figure rules, all non-zero digits are considered significant. So 19 has two significant figures, while 123.45 has five significant figures. 
Zeros appearing anywhere between two non-zero digits are significant. Leading zeros are not significant. So um, 00052 has two significant figures, five and two. Trailing zeros in a number containing a decimal point are significant. So if you're given a value of 12.2300, then you have five significant, um, I'm sorry, uh, six significant figures. Oops, I just miss, miss uh, counted them briefly. Um, and if you change your units around and now you have 0 0.00122300, you still only have six significant figures. The zeros before the one are not significant. The significance of trailing zeros in a number not containing a decimal point can be ambiguous. So that that uh, zero zero there, unless you have other information, it, it may or may not be significant. Orders of magnitude. This is when something is known imprecisely. We talk about um, orders of magnitude as, as powers of 10. So um, we might be able to say that that something that went from two tenths to one, that was a, a an order of magnitude increase, okay? Um, or if it went from four to 50, that would be an order of magnitude increase. Um, 30 to 3,005, that's an order of magnitude of uh, two increase. Um, this is just when we know something imprecisely, but, um, Perhaps we have better knowledge about what the, the that the the ratio is a better indicator than just either count value. So, city versus country population, four columns, one hundred seventy thousand versus three hundred twenty-five million U.S. So, when we're solving problems, you know, determine what you know. So, probably um, you know. Um, um, some of your independent variables, and you know what you want to get that we'll just call that our dependent variable for the moment. And we're going to need to think about how the quantities that we know are related to each other. And that will tell us what the unknown dimensions are. Okay. So set up algebraic equations to relate dependent and independent so that you can check their dimensions and units. Avoiding adding or subtracting quantities with different units. And then calculate what's what's missing. You know, if you have a an area and you want to know uh, an, an N, a number of individuals, then clearly what you need is a density value, numbers per meter squared. Very simple example, but that's the kind of, of thinking that we're, we're talking about. And then figure out what the, the units are on your, your unknown. Um, of course, always be careful with your order of operations and uh, take care of your significances. Um, you should always um, uh, talk about um, kilograms. For instance, units in singular, not kilogram. So it, it, you can, you can, you write it as kilogram, right? You speak it as kilograms, but when writing, just remember, because otherwise it looks like you're saying kilogram seconds. And then to see whether your answer makes sense in the context of your system. Whatever problem you're working on, read it carefully.